This is the transcript, the deposition of George S. Burgess. This is taking place in the U.S. House of Representatives. The Judiciary Committee, that's Jim Jordan, Oversight and Accountability are also joining in. That's James Comer. This depo took place Tuesday, January 9th in Washington, D.C. And we've got Garrett Ziegler, Marco Polo USA here today with us to unpack exactly what happened. Now, quickly, George S. Burgess is the gallerist, the guy who helped Hunter Biden sell his artwork. And we're going to hit the highlights. But let's see who is in the room. So, 9 58 a.m. Congress likes to get started, you know, 10 a.m. late morning. Who's there? Jim Jordan, Bishop, Goldman, Ocasio-Cortez, Stanbury are all there. So some Republicans, some Democrats, bunch of lawyers are all there from the Oversight Committee, Judiciary Committee, lawyers, counsel, counsel, counsel. We've got four George S. Burgess, couple attorneys here who are going to be there and with him. And here is the question about whether this is under oath. And so they say, okay, George, you should understand that although this interview is not under oath, that by law, you're required to answer questions from Congress truthfully. And do you understand this? He says, yes, I do. You understand all this? Yes, we do. Now, then we get into the actual examination. But here's how it starts. A question goes to George, Hunter Biden's art gallerist dealer. Says, all right, George, I want to start with a few questions about your background. Where'd you attend college? He says, well, I went to undergrad, University of California, Santa Cruz. I got a psychology degree. Do you have any professional background, educational background in ethics or compliance? He says, no. Are you a lawyer? He says, no. When did you open the gallery in Soho. He says 2015. And how many employees do you have? I've got one. Okay, just me and my, so somebody else. Now, how many paintings are in your gallery? He says, gosh, I don't know. Can you estimate? He says 40, 50, 60. I don't know. Do you store paintings? Yeah, I do. And are those stored outside the gallery? He says in the gallery. Oh, they're stored in the gallery. Correct. So you don't have to pay separately for any storage, right? Correct. You have to insure the paintings? Yes. And what does it typically cost? He says, well, I don't know, but I think I have up to $5 million in insurance or so. On the gallery website, you have a video that's about five minutes long, you say, I feel the relationship between artists and collectors. You know, it used to be a very unified relationship where it's very personal. You remember that video that I'm referencing, George? He says, yeah. You still believe that? He says, yeah. Would you say that it's kind of how you distinguish yourself as a gallerist, you know, fostering that kind of relationship? Yeah, well, that's one of the things I mean. It's yeah. And so that video was posted eight years ago. It's been kind of a principle for the gallery. He says, yeah, broadly speaking, it is. Now in that same video, you said you've made a salon style gallery. What do you mean by that? Well, that didn't really materialize realize it was a whole gallery. And so they're talking about how people just walk in and look at the art in your gallery. How many collectors do you work with? He says, well, I don't know. And it depends on a year. There's no set number. Do you have a relationship with the people that you buy art from or that you sell art to? Close relationship? He says, well, some of them. How about your artists? How many do you represent? He says, I don't know, 15, 16, not sure an exact number. Do you have a relationship with the artists that you try to take in? He says, I try to. Do you know the political affiliations of the artists that you represent? He says, no. What about the collectors? No. Do you care about their political affiliations? No, not really. Because an important part of your job, as you say in this video, is to make your gallery profitable, right? He says, well, profitable, but primarily to have some kind of impact in the art world. You know, it's a business, but not the sole purpose. And there are other functions of your gallery. They don't work unless you know make money. Now you yourself, George, you've made political contributions to both Republicans and Democrats. Is that right? That's correct. And in addition to original compositions, do you sell your prints? Well, you know, it's not the primary focus of the gallery. I'm not in the print industry, so I don't specialize in that. When you first started, how many paintings were you selling a month? Oh gosh, I don't know. It's been nine years. Fewer than you sell now? He says, no, actually about the same amount. How many do you sell per month? He says, well, it depends on the month. So it's cyclical, right? What was your annual revenue from last year? He says, gosh, I don't know off the top of my head. If you're asking me to make a declaration, a statement on that, I don't know. I couldn't do that. Any kind of estimate on how much money you made? I think we broke even lately. I haven't, you know, haven't these last few years, they've been pretty tough. Now, what about when you first began? Was it the same thing? No, I mean, obviously most businesses go through lost, certainly not making an exorbitant amount of money, which is interesting, right? Because wasn't he making, I mean, it's like, does he get into this like 40% of every sale was supposed to be coming to him? It was a handsome commission. Yeah. Especially that's... for the price that Hunter was commanding. I will say that although he wasn't in the primary business of prints, he did sell Hunter's prints. So if you think that Hunter's art skills are inflated and are partly a charade, just wait till you hear what he was charging for prints, not even the original god dang thing. Absolutely hilarious. Okay. Amazing. Yeah. Because, you know, Hunter's art artwork and we didn't really spend much time looking at any of it but I noticed it was terrible and then suddenly it got kind of decent you know like there was something that happened there and yeah it's such a degenerate corner of the art world you know my favorite author ever Tom Wolfe wrote a book called The Painted Word in the 70s even about modern art so all of this stuff is modern art and Hunter uses a particular type of modern art called like it's a type of canvas and then he blows through straws on the canvas so again this is not Jacques-Louis David 
read where you're going to be looking at this stuff 400 years from now. This is people like this, but in my world, in the classical world, this is slop. Okay. And so now they meet and this guy loves it. You know, he's like, that was just great paintings. Let's put it in my gallery. We're going to sell it to, you know, a bunch of DNC people. But here is now where they connect themselves. So question to George S. Burgess, Hunter's gallerist says, when did you first learn that Hunter had become an artist? Well, I met him maybe a year before his dad was elected. So that's how I knew he was an artist. That's how I met him. So I've been working with him when his dad was elected. I'd been working with him for over a year at the time. So when his dad was elected president, right? Yes, correct. So maybe like 2019, he says, yeah, something like that is when you met him. Yeah. And by December, 2020, it had been reported that you were, that you had become Mr. Biden's gallerist. And so that's right after the November election. Looks like Joe Biden won the thing. We still have some challenges. You know, January 6th hasn't happened yet or anything like that. But yeah, he's now going to be the gallerist for the president's son. Dick. The investigation of Hunter becomes public December 8th and December 9th of 2020. Ironically, one year to the day after the FBI took possession of his laptop. So all this is coming to the head at the same time. You got the announcement by Hunter saying that he's under federal investigation. Of course, he should have already been indicted. We talked about this at length. David Weiss slow walked it all. Normal person, Hunter Smith, would have been indicted probably June of 2020, truly. If we're being fair about the timeline, they started right. in earnest in May of 2019. You could honestly make an argument that normal people get indicted maybe six months after the investigation starts. And so you uh, said like June, middle of 2020 would be appropriate, but is that yes, right? Again, they, they, yep, they covered for him and they're not even DOJ yeah. regs require you to be this far out. They were saying we didn't want to interfere with politics, but again, that doesn't stand to reason because they always say that Hunter's not an elected official. If Hunter's not an elected official, he should have been charged when the normal person would have been charged. So the only reason why I bring that up is it's all coming to a head at the same time. The investigation's announced. It's now announced that he's selling art, this lobbyist and fake lawyer. Hunter Biden has never been in a courtroom, okay? He's a fake lawyer. This guy, literally, we knew somebody in the aughts who was working with him. There wasn't even a paper on his desk. He visited him at his office. Hunter didn't know work. He just called people. He was a rainmaker, again. So just some background about the timing and everything. Well, and I believe that. And I think that even the DOJ, I think even their unofficial policy is 60 days within an election, yes. I think was what they said, right? So, a And I would say, what statute is that under? Tell me right. where the Congress, tell me where our representatives put that into law, then I'll respect it. Say, oh, it's just policy. And of course, to hardliners like myself, I would say, you know, politely, you can shove your DOJ policy up your ASS. I don't care. But again, according to their own arguments that Hunter's a private citizen, they shouldn't go off that because he's not running for office. Maybe I'll agree with the 60 day window if it's for a person on the ballot, right. but Hunter's not on the ballot. They can't keep saying that. I just want people to know at home that this is Hunter never stopped lobbying. He just stopped registering. And when they say that I'm an accomplished lawyer, that I was qualified to be on the board of Burisma, just remember he didn't speak the language. He had never been in the energy sector before and he had never served a day in court on behalf of anyone. Yeah, he was selling access. He was the sure. bag man for daddy. So amazing. So question goes to George. So when were you, how, can you describe what the situation was when you were introduced to Hunter? He says, well, we had a mutual friend and she knows that I'm a gallerist and she liked his work. And she said she introduced me to a lot of other people, but it was, you know, this, there's this artist. So do we know who that person is? Who is this mutual yes. friend? Let's see if they, She'll they come get up there. Later. Lynette okay. Phillips. She's in our crosshairs. Lynette Phillips. Exactly. But it's interesting that he just kind of said her, the mutual friend, she. So I wasn't particularly driven anything with politics. I'm not a very partisan person, like very excited about, you know, it wasn't my excitement of seeing. It was just about the art. I flew in. I looked at his art. I liked the potential, what I saw. I also liked his personal narrative for a variety of reasons, but it's a process. And so nothing happened from that moment. And then, you know, we subsequently started texting. He was showing me his artwork, his progress. It's a relationship. So there's no start date. It's like any other relationship, right? So that's how it was. When you say you flew in, George, he was living in California. And at the time it was the Hollywood Hills. Paid okay, for so by, you, Kevin Morris. by Kevin Morris. Yeah, I'm sure. It's a nice property. I'm sure it's a nice Hollywood Hills. So then they get to this person. Okay. So who is the person that actually introduced you? Who is this friend? Her name's Lynette Phillips. Well, how do you know her? I met her a couple years prior at some French restaurant by the gallery. We became friends. What does she do for a living? Well, I don't, I know she worked for entertainment. She did videos for like Rihanna or something like that. I don't know technically what her job is. She involved in Democrat politics. I know she was involved in to some degree in some elements, but I don't know. It wasn't really my focus or the relationship. Do you know if she's ever hosted events where Hunter Biden has attended like public or like fundraising events? He says, I know she has. Yes. Do you know if Joe Biden has attended those events? I'm not sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if I'm not sure. When would you say this happened? Was it in 2019? He says, yes. And Mr. Petard, who I think is a George lawyer, 
lawyer. She says, and Bill Petard. Yeah, yep. Bill Petard. Cool. And says, and by this, you mean Miss Phillips introducing the two of them. Correct. So Miss Phillips introduced Hunter and George. Correct. An estimation off the top of my head. Yeah. All right. Now we have some more questions. Background on Lynette. We have a whole dossier on Lynette. Couple facts for people at home. Uh, Quentin Tarantino was a client of her. She ran a video production company. She also, this is on her IMBD website, IMDB biography. In 2011, Lynette produced the short film Sabina for the Clinton Foundation. It premiered at the Hollywood Bowl at Bill Clinton's 65th birthday party. Amazing. So it looks like here's a nice question and an answer from George. So let's see what he says. He says, okay, so you said you went into this a little bit. Can you describe how you went from being introduced to Mr. Biden to being his gallerist? He said, well, you know, it was just a process. It was a relationship. You know, I liked his art. I liked the trajectory. I liked his story, you know. I always like to tell people that, you know, Hunter, like so many of us, Hunter faced a crossroad in his life and he could keep going and die or do the hard thing, which is to change. And he did the hard thing. Now, and I think in many ways, this is why I think we like movies like Rocky, right? We cheer for someone because he's not supposed to win. To me, that's America. And I like that narrative. And I saw that he was a great artist and it was reflected in his art and it was inspirational. And that was my motivation with working with him. And that evolved through the relationship of us talking and building the relationship. There was no date when I became his gallerist until maybe the contract where we had, we had it in contract. But I always like to say, you know, if you, if I really have to depend on contracts strictly with an artist, with a relationship, it's a lot, it's verbal, you know, we paper it eventually, but again, it's a relationship. So I, there was no point, the more I got to know him and hearing his narrative, which is not uncommon in the art world, the issues with addiction and personal issues, what is uncommon is the ability to change, to make those hard choices, which I think, you know, to me, reflects to me America and that your past doesn't have to dictate your future, that ultimately we all face that crossroad in our life and we keep going or die or we do the hard thing and change. And he cuts him off. Can I just ask, at this point, were you aware of if Hunter had either sold or gifted his art to anybody before you had, before you had became his gallerist? So has he sold anything? Good well, point. I don't know about that, to be honest. That was one of the good questions that, that I hadn't thought of. I'm just being yeah. frank. So in other words, was this like unlogged art transactions that maybe are not on the record somewhere? I don't know about that, he says, to be honest. You don't know? Well, I couldn't make a declarative statement about that at all. Do you know if Lynette Phillips has any of Hunter Biden's art at all? I don't know. So as you're discussing, as this relationship is forming with you and Mr. Biden, when did you first sell a piece of his art? He says, gosh, I don't remember. Do you need to read the letter? He says, oh, okay, so is this, okay, so December 11th, 2020. Should we mark the letter as an exhibit? We've got numbers, a clean one. Can we go off the record, back on the record? So it sounds like the first thing was sold December 11th, and that's right after the election, obviously. Yeah, so right after Hunter announces he's under federal investigation. Oh, that's apt. So Hunter made the announcement before the 11th? Yeah, I think it was December 8th, December 9th or December 8th. Then start selling Our some paintings. Course. So according to your letter, the question, the first sale of Hunter's art was on December 20th. Okay, excuse me, December 11th. He says, yeah, I believe so. Now, I think that, now I'm not going to be act off the of of my head. I think he received 60% and I got 40%. What were the terms of the agreement? 60, 40. I don't recall. It was pretty general, but I think that's what I remember. He says, okay, and we're going to touch on this in a bit, but at this point, he says, well, that was the focus on the financial part. That's as a business guy, but yeah, I don't remember. Okay, so George, at this point, had there been any discussions about keeping the buyers of Hunter Biden's art anonymous? Because remember, the White House was telling us that there was going to be a separation between Hunter's art dealers because there was a concern that maybe somebody would buy his artwork for $250,000 or 500 grand, and then that would basically buy them access to the White House, right, through Hunter Biden. But if there's a separation there and Hunter doesn't know who the buyer is, there's no risk of there being some access. As we know, we're going to find out that's not exactly how it worked. And the agreement just specifies what George can do. Doesn't specify that Hunter can't figure out, just specifies that George can't tell him, which is one of their sophistry tricks that I'm going to blow a hole through. Amazing. So he says, I believe on the first one, in the first contract, he was. He was able to know who the buyers were. Okay. Yeah, I don't know how it was phrased, but I remember there, you know, that was the difference. Jim Jordan jumps in. He says, is that normal or unusual? Or where's that? Is that a normal kind of contract? He says, well, that part was different than, you know, normally the gallerist normally does not let the artist know who the collectors are. So Jordan says, so Hunter Biden wanted to know who was purchasing his art when he first started with you? And Jordan's like, yes, perfect. So he says, that was the initial contract, correct? Mr. Burgess, he says, yeah, that was the initial contract, correct. Did he say why he wanted to know? No, I mean, to be honest with you, as we started off with my philosophy about the gallerist and the collectors knowing each other, it was kind of at a par with my philosophies, like the collector and the artist get to know one another. So it was really, it's not conventional. That was, that was unconventional about my style of doing art, which I thought was aligned with it. So I didn't see so much anything wrong with it in that sense. So, you know, that that's it. Now, at what point when you're establishing this relationship with 
hunter, are you talking about potential clientele who might want to buy his artwork? Well, not at that point. I mean, at that point, I was really just working on developing the relationship. Nothing with politics, just a relationship. So during my first year, that's what I was working on. Didn't really focus on the contract. I was very lenient. And in the beginning, although it was not a usual request or that I would grant, it was in par with the vision of my gallery about letting collectors and artists get to know each other. So it was certainly in line with the trajectory of how I envisioned the gallery. So he's working with about 15 people right now. And 15, how many of them, when you initially started with them, asked to know who was purchasing their artwork, says That's Jim Jordan. Question. Which one of these things is not like the other? Uh, yeah, Hunter. I just try to be fair, right? Lord knows I'm tough on these congressmen most of the time, but sometimes they really do ask things I hadn't thought of before. And that's one of them. That's just yeah, which, that, that needs to be a paragraph. I'm circling it right now on my iPad. None. None of them. None, none. of them asked to know. Yeah. So this whole idea of, oh, it's just industry standard. These are industry standard things. And well, the reason why they don't actually care about it is because their daddy is not the president. They're not selling access to corrupt exactly. activities. So Jim Jordan's having a field day with this. Like, okay, only Hunter Biden. Perfect. And how did you introduce buyer A to Hunter Biden? They have a David that Pittard and his other lawyer, the lawyers for Burgess, gave the congressman and the staff a cheat sheet. Buyer A was corresponded to a particular painting. Obviously, I don't agree with this. We should see the cheat sheet. And if Marco Polo has anything to do with it, we'll get it. But just going forward, that's what they're talking about with all these letters. Okay, so we don't know the identity of buyer A, or do you think you know? No, not buyer A, no. Okay, we don't know buyer A. Okay, interesting. So, but Congress probably knows, right? Because they've got they the do. records. Too. I would wager they do. It would be very... Very bold for Burgess and his lawyers to come in with only buyer A and then the painting that they bought from. I know this. I know that it said buyer A, the type of painting and the amount, but I don't know if, if these lawyers and Burgess provided the name of buyer A. Okay. We've got a cheat sheet for you if you want. There it is. So he says, I don't know who that is. No. Oh, she's a collector of mine. She bought maybe 23 paintings before from my gallery. She's an established collector of the gallery. I've known her from years. Did you inform Hunter of the art purchaser or did they meet together? Like, how did that information transpire? He says, no, he doesn't know who she is or that she's bought to this day. He so doesn't, I, Burgess, Hunter doesn't know. No, 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 no. I'm just saying Burgess can't make a definitive statement like that. He should have a dependent clause, like to the best of my knowledge. He doesn't know. He can't testify to what Hunter does and doesn't know. He can right. only testify to what he knows. So again, if I'm the staffer, remember, I'm a, like a 70 year old curmudgeon put in a 27 year old's body, right? So if I'm the staffer, I'm interrupting Burgess right there and saying, wait, 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 this is a testimony of George Burgess, not Hunter Biden. How do you know, how yeah. can you speak to what Hunter does and doesn't know? Yeah, or did you ask Hunter whether you know that buyer A bought your paintings or something like that? And he said, no, I didn't know she bought my paint. You know, so he can't know that. He could have looked on her Instagram or something, right? And been following her on Instagram. She posted a picture Instagram of Instagram is newest... going to come up in this deposition, by the way. My newest artwork is posted and he sees it. He's like, oh, perfect. I know who that is, right? And they connect the dots there. So he says, no, I never, even though I was required, it was never really, I've never Never told it because to be honest with you, it's my collector database too. So it's kind of the bloodline of my gallery. It's an incentive why galleries don't want to give away their buyers. My inclination was to keep this stuff to myself. That is interesting. That's interesting sociology, isn't it? To keep it to myself, even though it well, was never it's put. Like Burgess, you know, I studied economics and Burgess is engaging in some rent seeking here. If the artists go directly to the collector, they can make an arrangement where the collector doesn't have to pay the 40% to the gallerist. So there's an incentive to keep them bifurcated. Right. But even that didn't stop Hunter Biden. He still figured out who it was buying his art. Right. Here's another one. So here we have this as another purchase, right? And so we've got two other purchases here. We've got William Jacks. So who is that? He's a good friend of George S. He's a shareholder of the gallery, part owner. He's a mentor and friend. What is his relationship with buyer A? None. They don't even know each other. Okay. A couple of months after that, this woman, Elizabeth Naftali, she's listed as purchasing a piece, mother and daughter. How do you know Elizabeth Naftali? Well, it says I met her through Lynette also. So she's a friend of Miss Phillips. Yeah. How many pieces has Miss Neftali bought from you? Two, I believe. Two Hunter Biden pieces? I believe so. Has she bought other pieces from you? That's no. a great she's question. A, yeah, she's a huge Hunter fan. No, she just wants his work. Nothing else here. Not interested in all my other paintings. Now she's, don't we know something about her? She's kind oh, of a- Oh, we, uh, we know so much, yes. Big real estate heiress in LA. Got appointed to the same commission that Eric Schwerin got appointed to, which they'll talk about here. Clearly quid pro Joe. She bought one before and after. After getting on the commission. She's a big Democrat donor. I gave, I think, 200 grand to a super PAC supporting Joey in 2020. That is such a good question. So again, for their plausible deniability purposes, they want George to be able to say yes to line 25 on page 22, but he can't. He has right. to say no. They're on a mission and, you know, an expensive mission. What was the price of those two 
paintings. One Hunter Biden painting was worth $52,000 and another one was worth $42,000. And that's the medium income for a family in my county. It's crazy, man. It's like for one painting that I've got questions about whether he even, you know, painted it. And yeah, we going. think that there's a collaboration going on. We can't prove it. So that's why we say we think. Again, this transcript, real quick, it doesn't include dependent clauses that need to be included. George shouldn't say, for example, those two, they don't even know each other. He doesn't, he can't say that for sure. Right. He doesn't know everybody that William Jacks knows. William Jacks is a huge businessman, lover of China. We did a dig on him and look at all of his SEC statements a couple of days ago. And so they don't, he doesn't know if buyer A knows him or not. He could say, to the best of my knowledge, I do not believe that they know each other. He's speculating on a lot of this. The questions continue about her. And was she something like an ambassador or something or was trying to become she an ambassador? She got appointed to the Commission for the Preservation of America's Heritage Abroad, which basically okay. looks after our cemeteries abroad and other antiquities. Eric Schwerin got appointed to it at the behest of Hunter and Joey in 2015. Wild. So question to George. Have you ever discussed Miss Naftali with Hunter Biden? Have I ever discussed with Naftali? No. Have you ever discussed Naftali with Hunter Biden? Well, just to, yeah. I mean, like she said, hi, or I just, I just met with, you know, very platitudes, nothing, nothing specific. That is likely a lie. So you could just tell from the transcript, man, I would like to see what the video looks like of that, but it sounds like he's squirming in his, yeah. in his seat. Platitudes. No, no, just platitudes. Like it reminds me of Joe Biden, who's just called to talk about the weather. I'm sure. So, okay. Question. Are you aware that on July 1st of 2022, Miss Naftali was appointed by President Biden to America's heritage abroad? He says, I read about it, but I didn't know about it. I didn't know anything about that. And that was after she purchased the piece from you, wasn't it? Well, I didn't know anything about that. I read it in the newspapers like everyone else. You're aware what the commission is. I think, you know, I think it's about preserving Jewish cemeteries in Europe. 15% of it. And those are important, right? That's about 15% of it. Yeah, he says, do you know anything about it? Oh, I don't. I don't. Okay. So he knows a little bit about it, you know, preserving these cemeteries, but I, then he doesn't know anything about it. Interesting exchange there. So are you aware, George, that Hunter Biden has previously arranged to have his business partner, Eric just Sherwin. Partner. There's Nerada. Yeah. It says park, right? Yeah. His business park. I kind of just corrected that. Maybe it was just a transcript error, but yeah, says no. And so that was while Joe Biden was vice president. And he says, no, I didn't know that. So when was it first raised to you that Hunter Biden's buyers should be made anonymous to him? When was it made aware to me? Yes. There was, I don't, you know, we had talked about it. So I don't know. As you can tell, I, even with the first buyer, I never told him. Uh-huh. So even though we had put something on the contract that where he's going to tell him, I wasn't really practicing that. So because it's, it's not something instinctively I want to do. So I don't know if a start date of when I started talking about it or when, what we, I don't, I know that we formalized it eventually. We papered over it, but I don't know. There's no time of day. I think of when we sat down, it's just a natural process. So again, like he's kind of stumbling all over himself. That was there. just puke. That yeah. He's puke. just vomiting. But there were multiple, are there multiple agreements that you've entered into Hunter regarding the sale of his art? I think it was, there was just two. It was two. Okay. So when was the first one? I don't know. It was 20. I don't know when the first one was. It was right, obviously before I sold the first one. I remember the process meeting in 2019, very slow. We went out to dinner, started texting. So you got to give it a few months. We're going to the point that we start formalizing something, maybe summer 2019 or fall. I don't know. And then a year later, we revised it. It was before maybe two months before the election, three months or something. Who wants to zoom in on this? Okay. The first agreement. Yes. And then, but don't quote me on sure. So then after Joe Biden's election, fast forward to the summer of 2021. Now, George, there's reporting that the White House is involved with working on a deal where Hunter Biden's buyers would not be made known to Hunter or to the White House. Remember that? Uh-huh. And only you would know them. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. What's correct? Is it correct that there was, that it had become public, that there was a new agreement that you, your, that you would be in charge of knowing who the purchasers were and Hunter Biden would not? It's correct that, that that was a public statement that I heard. So when did those negotiations or conversations with the White House begin? Because Jen Psaki came out and told us that they were installing a wall, right? Yeah. About as impenetrable as the Eagle Pass border right now. <laughs> You know, a layer critique. Again, total fiction. Saki right. had no basis for saying that. Every and, and here's the line that supports that, right? Here's George. I never had any conversations with the White House. Yep. So it's total fiction lines. Total Saki should be approached on the sidewalk with this. Yeah, maybe somebody will ask her some serious questions about that. So question to George. So the White House has given no input into your representation of Hunter Biden. My client did. My collect, my person I work with is Hunter. That's the only person I focus on. So the White House has given no input into your representation of Hunter. Question to George, how many contacts
contracts have you had with Hunter too? And did you have, well, there's one that's been made public, right? And that was dated September 1st. And there was another agreement prior to September 1st. There was, or after. So those two agreements. Now, are there provisions in both of those agreements that you're not going to disclose the buyer? In the first one, I was required to disclose the buyer. The only one out of all the 15 other clients that this guy has. And the second one, it was removed. So we took it out. It was the opposite. Maybe we should make that. Which one was it? Was it removed or was it the opposite? Was it removed or was it the opposite? Like, did they just delete that line or did they say you cannot know or you cannot disclose the buyer? He says, no, the first one was that I was required to disclose who the buyers were. In the second one, I was required to not disclose the buyers. Jordan says, and what changed? What caused the change? He says, well, I was just, I don't know, just what I was where we wanted to update it. He can't complete his sentence, man. No, That's he's so funny. he's changing thoughts. I'd love to see the video of this. He doesn't feel yes. comfortable. When you updated the contract, did Hunter Biden come to you and say, we need to change the contract? He says, correct. <laughs> oh, man. So it was Hunter who is now trying to change it right now. He wanted it in the first place so that he would know. Then he gets some feedback. I don't know who he talked to, dad or Jen Psaki, and then he wants to come back and change it. So, okay, we'll mark that as second exhibit, exhibit Q. They'll mark that. Who recommended the changes? You said it was Hunter. Is that correct? Yeah. So when you're seeing in the press that the White House is putting in certain safeguards regarding an ethics agreement, but you've had no conversations with the White House. I mean, did you ever say to Hunter, hey, you know, where's this coming from? This is in the press saying the White House is involved in this ethics agreement. They're not involved in the agreement at all. Did you ever say to Hunter, hey, where's this coming from? He says, I might have. I probably did. Yeah. And do you remember what he said to you? I don't. I remember. I do remember being surprised. Why were you surprised, George? Because I hadn't had any communication with the White House about the agreement. Did you feel like the White House statement was incorrect or not right based upon what they were reporting? He says, I felt that, I hate when this happened, like they cut him off, right? And this is his own lawyer cutting him off. Did you see the White House? I mean, do you know if what the White House statement is or did you just, I don't remember what, I just, I don't remember what the statement was. I just, you know, I don't. Well, you said you were surprised, right? And so I'm trying to understand what you were surprised about. When the White House is putting out this statement that they've been working with Hunter and the gallerist, that's you, regarding an ethics agreement and you've never had a conversation with the White House or counsel. You've never had a conversation with the White House, correct? He says, well, that's what surprised me. Well, did you ever see a statement from the White House or did you just see the press report about what the press was saying the White House said? Yeah, I saw, I think, the press reports. And he says, well, do you have any reason to believe that the press reports are incorrect? He says, well, they were incorrect. They're incorrect in what the White House statement was. It was incorrect. Was the White House statements incorrect, not the press? He says, I think my issue was, I didn't really see what the White House said. I saw what the press said. So I think maybe that was the disconnect. Connect. But what the press was saying was not, was what surprised me because I mean, I don't sit there and watch the daily briefings every day. That was a smart ass thing to say, but on his part, again, now this is sophistry. This is like Bill Clinton's grand jury deposition where he's arguing what the word is means. Right. The fact of the matter is, is they got him in a catch 22. Somebody's lying. And it just so happens that if we're to believe George, then the White House was lying. Perfect. We got it. You know, they can move on. The staff can move on because somebody was lying. Right. And he's very squirrely in his responses and you can even see it in the transcript. So we say here, Mr. Bird Yes, he answers this. Andrew Bates, absolute scum. This guy. This is a shout out to Brendan on our team who has a particularly fervent hatred of this man. He is the chief liar. Whenever they brought out, whenever they want to bring out somebody to be the attack dog, they bring out Andrew Bates. Absolutely. We've sent a report to all of his family members. Amazing. So he talks about him. He suggested, so he, this guy is the White House press secretary. He suggested that the buyer's confidentiality would ensure the process is ethical. This is George. Says the president has the highest ethical standards of any administration in American history. <laughs> And its family's commitment to rigorous processes like these is a prime example. It's like, oh my gosh, give me a break, brother. Okay, so when the White House spokesperson is saying that the president has established the highest ethical standards, he didn't, he, neither he nor his White House established the agreement or any of the rules about Hunter's art. Is that correct? And the lawyer jumps in, hold on. First, there's no, I'm not sure that George has ever even seen this article. This guy says, well, it was sent to him. And second, George, he can't testify about whether the White House did anything right. I actually agree with with that. Right. I agree with George's attorney there. That was right. sophisticated. It's all just speculation. So maybe they've done something. Maybe they haven't. He doesn't know. Well, I'll read the article from the Washington Post. Uh, the White House officials have helped craft an agreement whereby the purchasers will be kept confidential from even Hunter himself. So George, did the White House officials help you craft an agreement? Lawyer jumps in again. Well, what he can answer is that he talked to the White House, right? Was he, did the White House work with him to craft an agreement? I think that's fair. And he said, well, that was his question. Stop interrupting him. So we get to the 
a question. Can we go off the record? We go back on the record. And then they mark an exhibit from Aaron Ruparb. Absolute scum. Vox is toilet paper. Vox, Aaron Ruparb. Here's another story, which is another story. What's in the binder? We're passing it around. Do you see this beginning with White House officials climate on criticism? No, I don't see that. We're still trying to locate the document. Saki, Jen Saki, said on July 9th, quote, but all interactions regarding the selling of art and the setting of prices will be handled by a professional gallerist. That's you, George. Adhering to the highest ethical standards. That statement from Saki, if we're getting into the mind of the sophists, that statement read literally doesn't preclude Hunter from knowing any of his buyers. Just because George sets the prices and sells the art as a professional gallerist, adhering to the highest ethical standards, doesn't bar Hunter. The agreement just bars George. So again, I'm not saying you have to, but the public has to push back as much as they can on this agreement prohibited Hunter from doing anything. It didn't prevent Hunter from doing anything. Right. And the gallerist is going to be adhering to this and it's actually industry standards. So they say these are the industry standards that they're following. So the question- As if Saki and Matt, my friend calls him Andrew Master Bates, but as if Andrew Bates and Saki have any idea what the highest industry standards for fine art are. They don't have a clue. No, these people and they're, zeros. They're just talking points. They go out there. The media says, well, they're following high industry standards. And so, you know, that's just what they put on the cover of their articles. So the question was, at this point, the agreement that you had with Hunter called for you to disclose to Hunter who the purchases were, right? And then you did the second agreement, right? Now, the provision that was added, and correct me if I'm wrong, was the gallery will not disclose the name of the buyers, right? Yes. Now, is that one last sentence, is that whole, is that the protection? Is that one provision right there that prevents Hunter from knowing who's buying his art? What did you say? Is that one sentence? Is that the deal? Is that the sort of arrangement that protects Hunter Biden and the White House from knowing who's buying his art? They're getting at it, finally. He says, yeah. So there's no separate elaborate agreement conforming to high industry or high ethical standards. There's no other White House involved agreement, correct? Correct. So when anyone's talking about the agreement to keep Hunter Biden from knowing who's buying his art and the White House and with the White House representatives from the podium several times, they were, Jen Psaki's talking, right? What they're referring to in total is this one sentence, right? In your contract. Lawyer says he didn't know who, what they're referring to, but he can talk about what the contract says. He's okay, but to the extent that there's an arrangement or an agreement between Hunter and your gallery that protects the identification of buyers from Hunter, this is it, right? Like there's not another paragraph, another document somewhere else. We're not missing anything, right? And maybe you said this a minute ago and I apologize if I missed it, but what was the impetus to redo the agreement? You had initially had an agreement in 2020, correct? Right. Then you had one dated September 1st. It was initiated by Hunter. And do you remember how he initiated that? No, I don't. He says, if you remember, tell him. He says, well, I don't know. He says, if you don't remember, say, I don't remember. Okay. Did he call you on the phone? Did he text you? I don't remember. Okay. So your answer was, Bishop says, and was, I don't remember exactly. I just want to make sure you've exhausted your recollection. Even if you don't have a precise memory, but you remember something general about it. Do you remember? Well, it was an ongoing conversation. What do you mean by that? No, I mean, you know what? I don't remember. He says, no, I don't remember. I don't want to get into, I don't want to make declarative statements if I can't actually do so. Well, let me ask you this. What do you remember? Anything? I just remember that Hunter said that we should redo the contract. We paper it. We paper over what we were doing. That's, That's what they did with the loans from Morris too. This is painful. But I remember reading this. I remember reading this on Monday and I told my guys, God, this section was painful. They papered over it, what we were doing. I think that's kind of when you make a mistake or you're doing something wrong, right? You use that phrase like, yeah, we're just going to cover it up essentially. Okay. So to reflect the new contract because of what we're doing wasn't reflecting the contract itself. I wasn't sharing with him. I already was doing the right thing. And so we just made the contract reflect the thing I was doing. Says, okay, so there was a change in the commission in this one. I think there was. I think if there was something like a 5% difference in his favor, I'm not sure, but it was something like that. So, okay. So the new agreement is he gets more money and you get less commission. Yeah, I think so. So to the best of my knowledge right now, that's what I've got. Now, did you have a lawyer send this agreement to him? Yeah. So your lawyer, it was a lawyer for the gallery. Yeah. And this is, this is the standard artist gallery contract that you would use. Yeah, pretty much except for the changes that were requested. So to the best of your recollection, you think your lawyer sent this to Hunter or to Hunter's lawyer? Did Hunter get it directly or did Hunter's lawyer get it? I think my lawyer sent it to me and I sent it to Hunter and the handwritten change is on there, right? He wrote that he printed this out and changed some things. That's Hunter Biden, right? He says, um, let me see. I don't think so. It looks, yeah, yeah, pretty sure that is. It's Hunter. So he prints it off and scribbles some changes. I mean, he initialed it. These handwritten changes on there. Hunter's like, I don't like that. I don't like that. So then he initials it. I mean, he initialed it. So 
So that's his initial. So he made those handwritten changes in there. Yeah. And I did too. So yeah. Yeah. Okay. For some reason, the business insider got a hold of this contract. And I remember seeing RHB, his initials right by these line items. So literally on the operative signed version of the contract, you'll see Hunter Biden draw through something and then write RHB and then put in the new wording. Yeah. Perfect. And then they just signed it and they're like, we papered over it. By the way, in normal conversation, Robert, paper over has a negative connotation. I don't know if George knows that. He sounds like an idiot. When you paper over something, that means that you're breaking the spirit of the law, if not the letter. Sometimes both, but you're breaking the spirit of it. Oh, we just need to paper it over. You're papered over. It's like, dude, why would you say that in a transcript? Right. I totally agree. That's my take on it. When I hear that, I feel like somebody's covering something up. They screwed it up. They got to make a paper. deniability. That's what papering over is. So the question to George, okay, so to the best of your recollection, wasn't that exchange you and him or was it your lawyer and his lawyer? He says, no, it was me and him, me and Hunter. I was at his house. Okay. He says, yeah, we were in front of each other. His house in Malibu or Hollywood Hills or Malibu. He says, yeah, okay. So you're in Malibu. Did you specifically fly to Malibu for this? No, I think because I have other artists there. I was there. Okay. So I don't know if I went to look at my other artists. I wanted to kind of get this done. So I don't know. I don't recall exactly if it was. And he's like backpedaling there, right? No, I went to go visit other artists. Oh, you really? Who'd you visit? Well, actually I didn't, you know, he's anticipating where the questions are going and he's kind of walking it back. Okay. So it sounds like he's, you know, selling art to pay off some past debts, to raise some funds, whatever he's doing and says, okay, now we don't want you to speculate, George. If you had a foggy recollection, that's okay. But we'd like a recollection for a complete record. He says, all right, I'll try not to give you foggy recollections. So Bishop comes back. He says, okay, quite the opposite. And this is a serious point, George. If you have a general or somewhat formative recollection, but you don't remember every single detail, still tell us the part you remember. Got it? Yeah. Burgess is here. Bishop is here. He's saying, was this document number two that has some semblance of letterhead talking about him having his letterhead? Here's some more about Neftali. Question to George. We've discussed how certain buyers did become known to Mr. Biden. One of them was Elizabeth Neftali, right? Additionally, Kevin Morris, the lawyer who we'll talk about here shortly, has reported to have bought Hunter Biden's artwork, right? Do you know Kevin Morris? Yeah. How do you know Kevin Morris? Well, I met him a few years after Hunter. Where did you meet him? Think I went over to his house. I was when with Hunter the first time. His house is in California, correct? Yeah. Have you sold art to Mr. Morris before? That's another great question, right? So all of these guys are art collectors all of a sudden, as soon as they find Hunter. Who's Hunter selling? Wow. I love art now. I'm a connoisseur. And did you meet Mr. Morris through Lynette Phillips? I knew she knew him, but I didn't. I don't remember. I don't think it was through her. I think it was Hunter who took me over once. In the letter that you provided today, George, it shows that $875,000 worth of Hunter's artwork was purchased by an entity controlled by Kevin Morris. Is that correct? Yes. And that was on January 19th, 2023. Is that correct? And that's very recent, right? Like literally a year ago from today, you know, just about $875,000 total by Kevin Morris. That's that one person. And there's questions about that, right? Because not only did he pay off Hunter's tax delinquency, right? But now we have questions about how he characterized that. Was that a gift? Was that a loan? They papered it over as loans. And these art purchases go against the balance of that total, you know, shell game BS that you and I see through. Right. That's almost a a million dollars. Yes, of course. This is big money. Yep. And so there it is. January 19th, 875,000. Kuliaki Art LLC bought it. Is that right? Yeah. Did Mr. Morris come into the gallery to purchase these? No, we just negotiated. He had seen some of the pieces himself and also from the exhibition we did. This was negotiated over a phone, not him coming into the gallery. And so Mr. Morris had attended a Hunter Biden art exhibition, correct? When was that? At least he you know, saw the paintings. I'm surprised he even looked at them. When was that? He says it was the first one was the October, the year after the election. And so what year did his dad get elected? It was whatever, I think 2021. Okay, so that'd be October of 21. Okay, so then that's when it is. He says, did Mr. Phillips attend that? She attended. Yes, she did. I believe so. And at that exhibition, I think you described it as open to friends and family. Is that right? Yeah. Who had input into who would attend that exhibition? Well, the artist, which is Hunter, me, Kevin, friends, you know, his family, friends and family, inviting friends and family. So Kevin Morris was making suggestions about who would attend that exhibition. I believe so. Everybody who was involved was inviting their friends and family. Can you think of anyone else who was involved in making that list? No. Lawyer says this is the list. To be clear, this is the list of the invitees to the art show in Los Angeles. And you'd like to get your hands on that list because I'm sure there's some interesting names there. You know who's for sure there? The then sitting mayor of LA, Anthony 
Anthony Garcetti, who was appointed by Joey shortly thereafter to be our ambassador to the second largest country on earth in terms of population, India. And it took him over a year to get in. So the guy who went to Hunter Biden's art show in LA, Anthony Garcetti, is now our ambassador to India. Sounds about right. Yeah. Good That's way to get a position. Ambassadorship too. He barely got yeah. it. Like 52, 48. It was close. Because he's so corrupt. Garcetti's so dirty. From California. So question was, so okay, October 2021, you've already assigned the agreement with Hunter to keep purchasers unknown from him. And you didn't really know who was going to be showing up at the exhibitions. Well, the one in LA, nothing was for sale. It was just to show his art. There was no sale. The goal was to just kind of debut his art because he's from LA in his home base. So the exhibition was going to be in New York. So prior to sending all the work to New York, we said, hey, let's do a one day exhibition to show all his friends his art presented in a very proper way because most of them maybe don't want to go to New York. It was purely a one day thing. And so it was a friends and family kind of a thing. Did Miss Naftali attend that? I don't think she did. Has she ever attended a art exhibition? Well, she attended the last one, which was last December. Okay, but not this one the year ago. Very interesting. Okay, so question to George. So both Mr. Naftali and Kevin Morris, they've purchased art from Hunter, right? Yes. William Jacks, did he ever attend the art exhibition? Yeah, he did. Bill Jakes, yes. He would appreciate that you add the extra effort to call him Jakes, not Jocks. So we've got other buyers, A through G. Did any of those people attend Hunter's exhibitions? I think so. One maybe, yeah. One maybe. I don't remember all the buyers. A lot of them are already existing collectors. The majority of them are existing collectors. Question, when I go through your totals of the art that's sold, the totals that I add up is over 1.5 million. Does that sound about right for Hunter's art? Now, I don't expect you to pull out a calculator, but is 1.5 million about right, if you say so? And of that, $875,000 of that was sold to Kevin Morris. Is that right? Yeah. And so Hunter knows Kevin Morris, right? Yeah. And he knows that Kevin Morris was a buyer of his art, right? I would assume so. And then if you go to Elizabeth Neftali, Dan Goldman chimes in. Do you know that he knows? Burgess says, I don't know. Question. You don't know that Kevin Morris has put art in his house and Hunter Biden has gone to Kevin Morris's house and this has been reported on? You don't know that? George says he did have a piece of his in his house, but I think it was almost like it wasn't one that I sold. It was kind of like, you know, because he has so much art. All right. And that kind of goes back to that first question was Hunter exchanging art or giving art outside of George in the first place. Yes. That sounds- and that's such a good point. But just think about this. By the rules of the art game, Hunter can make one doodle and sell that to Morris for $5.9 million. And Morris can then say that's going towards the balance of your loan because it's completely made up. It's completely intrinsic. So this is why they love this sort of grift because that Hunter, let's put it this way. Hunter is not going to give Morris physical cash ever. Well, it's probably going to happen again. This is speculation. I'm using speculative language, but what would make sense based on their history and comportment and character is Hunter do one more doodle and Morris just appraise that at $6 million and then they get to wipe their hands of it all. I've got questions about that transfer. I mean, like if Hunter's selling art for $50,000 a pop or for $250,000 or whatever, right? That was some value was exchanged there. So did Hunter, you know, gift a $50,000 painting to this guy? Did he declare that on his taxes? Like it's a transaction that I think should be inquired about because we don't know how to categorize it. And Hunter already has a history of tax problems and tax crimes. So yes. it's worthy of an investigation. But question to George, why? Well, did you take any extra steps or precautionary steps to ensure that Hunter Biden wouldn't know that Kevin Morris was one of the purchasers of the art? Well, if he knew it wasn't because of me, I would have never told him, you know, like, so if they know it's because they know, but not because of me. Okay. But Kevin Morris is allegedly a lawyer, pff, very close friends. He's purchasing $875,000 worth of art, which is why I said, I assume, well, listen to his question. Okay. And said, it's fair to assume that there's going to be an issue when Kevin Morris buys that art that Hunter is likely going to find out about it. Correct. Correct. Well, you know, he is. So I'm sorry. I'm trying to recollect and remember everything. I think he, he, he would, he did know. He did know. Who's he? Hunter did know because of, because he did know because instead of, he did know because I think it went against his payment against the debt that he owed Hunter, that Hunter owed to Kevin. So they had, he had to have known who it was. Yes. So he did know, man. It's like, gosh, just spit it out, man. This is what college education produces today. I mean, this guy has like a master's degree. That's how great inflation works. It doesn't sound like he's being forthcoming. It's like Hunter knew, you knew he knew, just say it. We can come back to the debt issue in a minute. Okay, so Hunter is, like you said, you can subjectively value this artwork and then hide your money to Hunter in this exchange. Okay, so question. But then Naftali, Elizabeth Naftali 
who also purchases 42,000, a total 94,000 in art. Is that right? Yeah. From Hunter. And Hunter eventually finds out that Elizabeth Naftali has purchased his art through what? Media reportings, right? Yeah. Media reports that he's like, oh, perfect. So correct. Because you know about it, right? Right. And did Hunter Biden know that your other gallerist at your, I forget if you stated it was your partner at the gallerist or your business partner, whatever, Jake's. Did Hunter Biden know that he purchased the art? I don't know. Is it possible? Yeah, it's possible. Based upon my math, just the Kevin Morris and the Elizabeth Neftali purchases, those total 60% of the money that was spent on Hunter's art. Is that right? Okay. So we can say, and if you add in Bill Jake's, it's approximately 70%. So despite the agreement that's been set up, it looks like 70% of the art that's been purchased, Hunter knows the buyer based on my calculations. So my question to you is, he says, you know, by the way, Bill Jake's, he did know about Jake's because he went to his house once and he saw one of his pieces. So correct. Yeah. And so you could imagine that, right? If you buy a painting, you're like, I better invite Hunter Biden over before I ask him for this favor. So can you confirm, George, that Hunter is aware of 70% of the buyers of the art of the purchase, the total purchase price? Mr. Batard jumps in. Question was, based upon my calculation, it appears 70% of the art was purchased and Hunter knew who it was. My question is, I don't see any safeguards about what to do if Hunter finds out about the buyer. Was there ever any discussion of, quote, we'll refund the money if he finds out, or we'll report it to the White House if he finds out, or we'll report it to our lawyers? Because there has to be a world where you envision that Hunter is going to find out about the buyer, but the contract itself provides absolutely no teeth at all for what happens when Hunter finds out about the buyer. George, do you see what I'm saying? Uh-huh. So was there any discussion with the White House, with Hunter, about what would be done? Would there be a refund? Like, how would that work? Otherwise, this agreement is completely toothless. So <laughs> how, what was built in there to prevent this type of Hunter Biden finding out about the buyer? I said, sorry, that was a- that, No, that's it. That's the most important statement so far, in my opinion. And it wasn't even a question. It was a statement. It was a fiction. It was just to create, they papered over it, like they said, to give Jen Psaki a talking point. Okay, sorry, that was a long question. Yeah, he says, correct. You're asking a clarifying question and everybody's getting into it. Stansbury, Goldman. Goldman says, I'm talking about the contract and the breach of contract. So then we get another question to George. Did this contract that you and Hunter laid out provide any ramifications if Hunter were to find out the buyer of the art? He says, which contract? Exhibit two, which tab? Q, got it, okay. Were there any ramifications if Hunter were to find out? Are you asking if he finds out from anyone or if he finds out from George, from anyone? George says, well, no. And then Ocasio jumps in. She says, just to clarify, just to clarify, Hunter finding out about a buyer in general does not constitute a breach of this contract, right? So she chimes in. What if Hunter finds out through Instagram or something? George says, correct. That is not a breach. Okay, so if you were to disclose specifically that buyer, that would be a breach. Ocasio's, you know, digging in on this. So, okay, so Hunter can just find out from anyone else, but you can't tell him, correct. And he could end the contract if I told someone about it. So in this specific, the White House questions aside, says Ocasio, in this specific contract between the two private parties, yourself and Hunter, the breach, any breach of the contract with respect to you would not need a ramification if Hunter finds out because it's not outlined in the contract. Correct? Correct. 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 Three corrects. And I think our time's up. And so we'll take a break. And so that was a full two hours for 1154. They break at 1154 in the morning. So they're back from the break. Now Stansbury is up. Miss Stansbury. I want to ask you a few clarifying questions. Is this a congressperson? Yes, it is. When their name Said, is not protected, it is. Yes, sir. This is Miss Stansbury. Says, how long you've been working as a gallerist? 10 years. You work with other artists? Yes. And is it common as artists to get going in their art career as they're soon as they're getting started? Is it common for them to work and develop out a collection and a voice before they're commercially viable? She says, yes, it is. He says, yes, it's required. Right, exactly. And so would you say that is what has characterized your relationship between Hunter and you, right? So the relationship you were describing that began in 2019 was just about a gallerist helping Hunter to prepare. That's what I do this with all my artists. Stansberry represents Santa Fe, which is a huge liberal art bastion, just FYI. Yeah, so she's talking about this. This is kind of cultivation and development. Yeah, so Hunter's untrained. He's just getting going. And so you rely on your family and friends, your family and associates, right? He says, correct. Thank you. So she turns it back over to the lawyers. Dan Goldman, the guy who bought his seat in New York, says, excuse me, counsel, can I just have one quick line of questioning before we get going? He says, hi, I just want to focus in on just on this list for a second of all the pieces of art that Hunter sold that you sold. So, okay, Goldman says there are 10 total buyers, right? Yeah. Seven of whom are anonymous? Correct. And they're anonymous because you're trying to protect their identity from public scrutiny because they're mostly regular buyers of yours, right? Yeah. And so these experienced buyers in the art world, let's focus on A through G. He says, well, for the most part, well, you said buyer A had bought 23 paintings, right? So 
they're pretty knowledgeable. He says, yeah, they're not dependent on you alone to tell them what's valuable or what's not, right? Right. And also my experience, says George, that I've had now what happens to artists when I start representing them because they become more successful and they become more valuable, says Dan. Yeah, I get them into museums. I get them into Venice and artists get shortlisted all over the place. And so when an artist gets gallery representation, then people start buying their art. And that's why museum acquisitions are important. And so, yes, she, like the first one, is very experienced, but also experienced enough to know that my style of working is very advantageous to the artist. Goldman says, and the only way that you're able to access, to get access to all of that, is to build up credibility over time, right? Yeah. And so the people are not just taking it on faith that you actually have a track record, right? Yeah. And I just want to point out a couple sales here. Buyer B purchased this one for $75,000, right? Yeah. And then two lines down, buyer C bought another piece for 50 grand. And then further down, D bought one for 85 grand. So based on this, now we don't have Mr. Morris's purchases. Goldman says, it's accurate to say 85 grand by buyer D, 75 grand by buyer B. They're the two most expensive pieces of art that were sold. Is that true? He says, yeah, that's true. Stansbury jumps back in. May I ask another follow-up? So look, you know, looking at the actual purchase list here and going back to the other questions. So as an artist is evolving, in this case, it looks like Mr. Jake's, Jake's, I'm sorry. They were initially supporting Biden. Is that correct? Yeah. And then if you look at the kind of evolution of buying over time of six months after his first show, we started getting more prominent, well-known collectors. So they're just articulating that this is all natural, right? This is just a budding artist. It's like a new kid. They're just kind of showing him the ropes. Nobody who's new is commanding 75K. Even if you put it back into $1895, Van Gogh couldn't command that. Hunter is commanding more in his first couple of years than Vincent Van Gogh would. This is yeah, a and, and I'm just so glad that in 40 years when they play this back, we will look so prescient. We'll have known the con in the time of the con, which is very rare. Patting right, ourselves and back and all these commenters too, they get it. Right. And it's open. It's public. We can, I mean, these are yeah. transactions that they're talking about and are happening right under our noses. So Goldman continues. He says, okay, so all of these buyers, A, B, C, and D, they all purchased like eight pieces of art and they all did so prior to Kevin Morris purchasing any art. And so someone says, are you finished? He says, yeah, I'm done. So now we're back with George. Says, my name is so-and-so. I'm oversight counsel with judiciary. So we're going to try to be succinct here. Thanks for your patience. Now, looking at the top of this list, George, buyer A purchased an untitled piece 2020 on December 11th for $13,000, buyer A. Did you disclose the name of that buyer to Hunter? No. How about Jake's? Did you disclose Hunter Jake's? No. Third line, William Jake's purchased St. Thomas for 25 grand. Did you disclose that to Jake's? No. Fourth line, another painting for 25 grand to Jake's. Did you disclose that? No. 42,000 from Elizabeth Naftali did not disclose that one. 75,000 for buyer B did not disclose that one. Next line down, buyer C, just one after the other. Okay, so buyer C, did you disclose? No. Buyer A, did you disclose? No. Now, just to expedite things, the rest of the sales, you did not disclose the identities of any of those buyers. No, I never disclosed any of the identities of the buyers to Hunter Biden. No, thank you. Again, is George. It doesn't mean that Hunter didn't know. It just yeah. means he wasn't actively disclosing things. So we turn back. Now, you were asked questions in the previous hour about your initial contact with Hunter and your contract with Hunter. You recall that? Yeah. So the first contract required you to disclose the identity. True? Yeah. Did you actually disclose anybody to Hunter? Of course not. I did not. No. Did Hunter pressure you to disclose the buyers? Never did. Oh, never did. Did he push the issue in any way to get you to disclose the buyers to him? Absolutely not. And when you executed the contract, the new provision said that you should not disclose, right? Right. Just papering over what was already what we were doing anyways. There it is again. So all that was, it was a memorialization of your conduct that you had been engaged in with Hunter of not disclosing who the buyers were, right? So nothing really changed at all. You just formalized what you were already doing. And there was never a point where someone would come in and buy a painting and you'd pick up the phone and call Hunter. Oh, I never did that. Oh, never. Okay. A couple more specific questions about your commission rates. If you go to paragraph three, it talks about commissions. It says gallery shall receive 40% of commissions. Is that true? Yeah. Is that the standard outlining commission rates with artists? Yeah. Is the 40% commission rate that you offered to Hunter within the range of standard commissions that you would give? Yeah. And he says it's exactly industry standards. It also says that galleries shall set the prices based on their best professional judgment. Is that true? So your contract says that you're going to set the prices, right? Right. Is that clause in line with a typical contract with an artist? Yeah. And it's a clause that the gallerist sets the prices. That's standard, isn't it? Yes. So it's fair to say that your artists are not responsible for their own prices. No, they're not. So you set the price of Hunter's artwork. Was Hunter responsible for setting the terms, for setting the price of his art? It was me. Only me. So the second part of the sentence states that the
the gallery sets the prices based on their professional judgment, right? So that means you. How long you've been doing it? 17 years. Well, he says, if I tell you to buy a painting for $100,000, that's my professional responsibility. I have a responsibility to the artist, but I also have a responsibility to the collector. I'm not going to last in the industry if I'm selling pieces for 100 grand that are not worth 100 grand. So when I do my pricing assessments, I take into account whichever collector purchases those pieces. I got a responsibility to ensure prices are legit. So there's a tension between all of this. That's why I am doing what I'm doing. He says, right. Okay. Sounds like you've got experience. So I had been selling her overpriced paintings. Had I been, she wouldn't be coming back time and time again. So they set a price that the market supports. And of course, Hunter has a very unique market factor to him in that he's got access to the president. Mm -hmm. And you stand by all of the prices that you've sold. Yeah. And would you be able to sustain a business as a gallerist if you sold collectors at unfair, unsustainable prices? No, no one would buy from me. Acting like this is a mar like an open market. It's not, right? It's a basically a private market for certain people to access this grift. So yeah. I would like to talk a little bit about your process for setting the price. What do you do? Well, it depends. If an artist has a history of sales, I look at the history. If it's a new artist like Hunter, I just do it from my experience. There's also his name is important, whether we want to admit it or not. It's true. If it's Anthony Quinn or something, it does play a role. But what I, if I like the art, do I think it's going to be sustainable for my professional experience? And then what I generally do is I put a fair price, nothing aggressive. I know there have been media reports about 500 grand. I never said that. And I think you can see I never priced anything at 500 grand ever. I never priced anything at 300 grand of Hunter's art. So I put a certain price, then the market eventually dictates it, right? So eventually, so this is the intro with the new, especially as a new artist. I give my opinion. I see what the market dictates. So everything was in the work, everything that that paragraph, he said, I've been working with Hunter for four years. The market sustained the prices. And so I set it based on sales. Now, I want to go back to some of the other factors you said. Do you consider the aesthetic value? Yeah. What do you think about Hunter's work aesthetically? Oh gosh. I love who he was. I love his personal narrative. He had a fork in the road like we all do. And what about the art itself? He says, when I look at Hunter's paintings, I see hope. I see perseverance. <laughs> I see, to me, their totems of the hero's journey, as Joseph Campbell would call it. The idea that tomorrow is a better day. This is beautiful. Now, sometimes when I look at some of his pieces, I'm having a bad day and a dark piece, and I'm just living with it. I look at it, and I'm reminded that someone else has felt that way, and I'm not alone. There's a feeling of strength and the commonality of the human experience. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, I'm a pretty sentimental guy, personally. Ugh. It's just, that's over the top for me, even, because he can never describe which talents Hunter has, and, you know. It's just slop. This is probably a good time to transition to Morris because we've already established that Hunter knew 70% of the buyers based on value. And we know, and they go through the names already. So if you do want to transition and do both tonight, having gone through both of these transcripts before in full, obviously you have as well. I think now is probably the best time. That sounds good to me. Yeah, we'll transition over. A lot of this is also from the other side, right? It's all going to be, there is nothing else going on here. There's nothing else strange, right? This is all about above board. This is just a regular artist who's going into a new career and he's got a nice helping hand and it's all above board. There's nothing funny here, nothing fishy here. And so there's just going to be more of the same pattern from yeah. George S. Burgess, the gal. Yeah, I just think we got, in terms of the rack of ribs, we got most of the meat off the bones.